You ever heard of Evil Knievel? Okay, how about Sea Dragon? Yeah, that's what I thought. The history of private rocket development is mostly the story of engineers teaming up with investors to build a rocket, which usually ends up with some sort of failure during testing and then investors pulling out. This one's a bit different. Enter Robert Truax. Captain Robert Truax is one of the original U.S. rocket pioneers. I'm not making a biography of him, so I suggest the documentary Bob Truax, the U.S. Navy's Rocket Man, instead. Instead, I'll list some of his projects. Whack Corporal, Jado, Thor, Viking, and Polaris. And then there's the other one. After his time in the Navy, Truax worked in Aerojet General's Advanced Development Division on a super heavy lift rocket named Sea Dragon. We'll cover that eventually. Truax's vision was that of a sea-launched, and recovered, large pressure-fed rocket. Big Dumb Booster's advantage comes from simple low-tech systems, and sea launching allows for very simple launch infrastructure. We'll look at this in the future as well. For a Sea Dragon proof of concept, Truax got an Aerobee sounding rocket and modified it for launching in the water. And it worked! Unfortunately, Sea Dragon was cancelled with a lot of other post-Apollo ideas. Truax left Aerojet and founded Truax Engineering to pursue sea-launched rockets. At some point, he was involved with engineer Doug Malawicki in building the Sky Cycle X2 for legendary daredevil Evil Knievel. Sometime around the unsuccessful Snake River jump, Knievel gave Truax $1,000 to $3,000 for a study on a Sky Cycle X3 to send him to space. In 1974, Bob started work on building the X-3. Unfortunately, Knievel ended up in financial trouble, unable to produce the roughly $1 million needed to make the project go. But that didn't stop Bob. Instead, he put out an ad for an astronaut. All he needed to do was cough up $100,000. But first, let's take a look at the rocket itself, which was started officially in roughly 1977. The Volks rocket was 25 inches in diameter and 24 feet tall. The nose section was built out of surplus jet fuel tanks and would house the passenger and parachutes for recovery. The seat was a leftover stunt plane seat, and the passenger would fit in pretty, uh, snugly. Below the passenger was the main rocket body built from an unknown steel alloy. Enterprise was a pressure-fed LOX kerosene system that would use 2,000 pounds of propellant. The helium tank in the middle was a titanium pressure sphere from the X-15. For propulsion, the rocket used four surplus LR-101 vernier motors, generating 1,000 pounds of thrust each. Bob got them for $25 each. Quite the bargain, though he had to modify the propellant feed system for four motors instead of one. LR-101s, by the way, were the steering motors on the Atlas and Thor, later Delta, launch vehicles. Volt's rocket would weigh 3,100 pounds at liftoff and 1,100 pounds dry. The main engines would burn for 60 seconds, burning out at roughly 30 and a half kilometers. Apogee would be 50 miles, 80 kilometers, though another source suggests 100 kilometers. The rocket would descend back to the surface and use the parachute to splash down. From there, the passenger would be recovered and a helicopter would take the rocket back to the launch site to fly again. With the ad in the Wall Street Journal, a series of interesting characters, all penniless wannabe astronauts, contacted Bob. The first serious candidate was Daniel Correa, a Peruvian who was set to make a few million dollars selling tortilla steamers. Except the tortilla steamer had a fatal flaw which prevented it from being sold in the United States. Uh, oops. And this is about 1979, for reference. Truax ended up talking about this on Johnny Carson, who also turned down an offer to be the first private astronaut. Another figure eventually emerged, Fel Peters. He was a San Jose businessman who was crazy about space. The story goes that he walked into Truax's garage and laid down $40,000 in $100 bills until Truax caved. Now this is the part I'm uncertain about. From what I've read, it sounds like Truax never got enough money to launch any of his astronauts, and the program fell through in about 1980. Oh, and he wouldn't fly himself, saying, I'm a chicken. Besides, who'll go back to the drawing board if the thing goes boom? During this time, Truax did get followers and assistants to help build the X-3. Probably the most notable was Gina Yeager, uh, no relation to Chuck, who flew around the world with Dick Rutan in 1986. The timeline for this part is very fuzzy, but Truax Engineering did work on CLR for the Navy to develop a sea-launched and recovered rocket 
for the 1990s. Here, another X3 was built, that's the red guy, and tested for sea launching capabilities. The footage here shows engines being fired from the side of the barge, and then all the way submerged. By the way, uh, this works. This test article did suffer a failure after a few cycles. What was also tested was sea-based recovery of stages, which had been done before with CB rockets. Yeah, no barge landings here. All you had to do was wash off the booster with fresh water to prevent corrosion. It's pretty neat. CLR was cancelled in 1996, and it sounds like work stopped on X3 somewhere around 1991. Bob Truax died on September 17, 2010. Would the Volks rocket have worked? Most likely. Unlike other private rocket ventures, this one had a flight article nearly ready for flight. Technically, everything up to actual flight operations was tested. The engines worked, the tanks worked, and the recovery methods had been tested by Truax. All that was left was the guidance system. As a space tourist rocket, I have my doubts. The vehicle was small and cramped, limiting the possible passengers not only physically, but mentally. Truax didn't talk much about abort capabilities or contingencies, nor anything about egress or other safety aspects for a passenger vehicle. If it had been used as a reusable commercial sounding rocket, then I can see some promise. That depends on how it all ended up working, of course. Enterprise was a great testbed for future CLAR development. Of the three first serious private rocket developments, Project Private Enterprise is the strangest and probably most inspiring, if you were to ask me. Robert Truax was an American rocket icon, not only for his pioneering work in developing missile technology, but for building a rocket in his garage. His work on building and testing Project Private Enterprise might not have led to the dream of sea-launched pressure-fed boosters, but he proved that you can do it yourself. In fact, Copenhagen Suborbitals has taken the mantle of a homemade rocket with their planned Spica or Spica vehicle, set to launch a passenger to space by 2030. Project Private Enterprise. That's a rocket you know.